friend, so you know where I want to start? I want to start with, uh, you know, I, I, I spent some time with a friend of Anna's just the other day who was talking about her 10-year-old nephew who's becoming a burgeoning TikTok star. And wow. um, I sort of sat back and thought, I'm, I'm getting really old <laughs> because even in, in my digital universe, I feel like I'm outdated in my perspectives on content. And what I want to start with is, is just your views on how the changing conditions, both from a kind of social perspective, from a digital access perspective, from a kind of democratizing of influence perspective, how content has evolved over the last two years and what your perspectives as, a, as an expert in this space are as you see it growing. I think, uh, and of course, thank you for having me. I'm so thank happy to be here. here. I think um, content obviously has just become a lot more accessible. Um, especially just in the sense that we are so accustomed to mainstream media as a whole that includes, you know, how you receive your news and your information. And there is a there has been a little bit of a, a monopoly, which is a good and a bad thing. A good sure. thing in the sense that you have people who are experts that we get to listen to and hear from. The bad thing is now anybody can pass off information and you can't differentiate between what's fact and what's fiction. Hence, even with the virus, there's so much confusion. But when it comes to content um, that is consumed, which obviously ranges from factual all the way to entertainment, I think it is so amazing that literally all that a person needs to have is a certain type of phone and they can create content. Um, you know, I've interviewed the most followed TikTok South African star, uh, a girl by the name of Whitney, a lady by the name of Whitney, and she's transformed her life. Under normal circumstances, mainstream media would have, there would have been some kind of gatekeeping to say, we don't actually want to see someone in their pajamas dancing to random videos. And now she actually was able to move her mom from Limpopo, you know, into Gauteng to a better life because of that. So I think it's more accessible. There's less gatekeeping. They, it has opened us, opened us up to more genres of the kind of content we consume because the short form has evolved. Obviously, with your apps, your Instagrams, your um, Facebooks, a, a television, for example, as one of the mainstream medias, has kind of restricted us to more long form, which it's, there's still space for that in its, in its traditional sense. And now the content can be as short as five seconds. And this five second thing can go viral and literally give a person an entire career. And I think that's amazing that you don't have to be, you know, a graduate of AFTA to create a career for yourself. And it makes the space more competitive because now we're a smaller fish in a bigger pond mm -hmm. and you have to be unique. You have to be creative. You have to be interesting, but you also can just be very simple telling the truth or crying on camera. And that in itself is content that, you know, supply and demand, it, 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 it will show you if something's going popular because someone's crying and their life can get changed. There's a demand for that content and people are watching. So I think it's just more vast. It's more creative. It's more interesting. So you, you straddle the world of, as you said, factual information and then entertainment media and the production component of both of those universes. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, as you rightly point out, the kind of burgeoning misinformation pandemic is a major concern for anybody who's yeah. interested in society's health and the quality of our thinking. But I'm really curious to hear more about your perspectives on like I would have thought that all of this consumer generated media and all of the social media that we have access to might have distracted some of our audiences from the more traditional, highly produced uh, entertainment media channels that we've become used to kind of growing up and over the last couple of years. Do you sense that the audience has become distracted or they're even more invested in content mm. than ever before? How has it impacted your, your audience's mm. dynamics and behaviors? I think it's twofold because when we say the audience, it's about which audience are you speaking about? Sure, sure. I'm generalizing. So the, the way that I split my audience in my mind in terms of the work that I, I do is the audience that has access to internet and which is your lower income earning groups, which are predominantly black in South Africa and 
your higher income earners or those that have access to the internet. And the reason I split it is because the ones that have access to the internet are more likely to be digital. They're more likely to be connected to, you know, your Facebook streaming, Facebook services, and streaming and, yeah. services. And then you have your traditional uh, a viewer. So if I speak to your traditional content consumer, it is still extremely important and they have a big role. Hence, you know, I will always advocate for the, the national broadcaster to function, the SABC, because they still speak to the biggest audience. So where you might have a TV show that trends every single week, it plays, um, even something that we're streaming and it's trending and it's number one on the trends list and we're talking about it on Twitter. We still need, when you think of perspective of like, hey, the, the South African population, we're approaching what, almost 60 million people. It's if only 1 million people, even, even less than that, it's still a tiny amount. Whereas your national broadcaster, your top performing shows are sitting at about 10 million viewers. So it just goes to show that sometimes we're in an internet bubble because it's sure. so loud that we think the digital era is still the big thing. Whereas traditional media, yes, your younger generation, your millennials might be finding ways to be like, I'm more of a binge watcher, I'm more of a this. But we look at our national unemployment rate, we look at the fact that the youth are unemployed, many of them don't have access not only to the correct devices to watch your streaming services and have the different social media platforms, but they also don't have access to the internet, which means what is it that they are watching? They have a microwave TV with an aerial, which means they are watching our free-to-air broadcasters. So I still think that there's a massive role to be played. Hence, when I came up with my talk show, which was initially a simple audio po podcast, that I was like, okay, I want to do a pod podcast because I miss talk radio, but I don't want somebody restricting me in terms of time and adverts and all those things. Yeah. Why don't I do this thing because I miss talk? And then I was like, but actually I'm a visual person and everyone knows I'm a TV producer, so let's make it visual. But actually mm -hmm. I don't want to just do it on my phone. Let's like bring cameras in my house, you know, and it just evolved. But the entire time I was like thinking about the fact that I am a traditional media broadcaster, but I need to create something that's going to speak to all the different mediums. So while while we might think, hey, are millennials and young people abandoning traditional media? I would say many are, but it will they're not abandoning it to the point that it's dying. No one is, you know, multi-choice is not going to shut down. No one is not watching DSTV. Yes, some people can't afford the subscriptions. They had to downsize their lives, especially mm -hmm. over the past year and a half. But you can still access that content, even in its short forms, on the digital side. So what people do now is they take clips of different scenes and they yeah. upload them onto TikTok. And that's how they're consuming from the main source. So you almost have like secondary viewing of Amazing. the initial program. So I think there is space for both of them to exist at the moment. I think traditional media still is bigger. Your advertisers that can afford will go traditional media because it's mass market, it's your sure. eye. You know, so you think of your, you know, your pick and pay checkers, your big grocery mall. Everybody's always going to need food and you're going to predominantly advertise to where people's eyeballs are, which is your, your television box sets. And secondary is the digital, which is growing. We are going to get there as soon as, you know, data falls and it becomes accessible to everybody. And as soon as everybody can afford smartphones. It's, it's such an important reminder constantly, not just in terms of economic dynamics to remember that I'm obviously I occupy the position of a privileged minority. Yeah. Uh, but I also enjoy access to content like it's a running tap, right? Like I never think about, and I mean, it, that it's very easy to forget how recently that wasn't the case, how recently I would be counting megabytes, even as the privileged elite, right? So, so how much more so for individuals that are, that, you know, really skipping from a SIM card to SIM card to try and get the most out of their data on a day-to-day -day basis. And here I am talking about, you know, uh, 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 traditional versus digital, like it is a uh, kind of a nationwide dynamic. I mean, that is a, a timely reminder. Social media is not <laughs> reality, is it? For us as middle classes, traditional versus, you know, your, your new age digital mediums of content, 
ingestion are a privileged conversation. For mm. many, that's what you got. You've got the few free-to-air channels that don't require uh, a, a decoder, that just require bunny ears to be connected to your TV for a, for a signal. So I think yeah. we, we acknowledge that we're in that, in that uh, minute few. I mean, I can tell you, when I bought my, my laptop, it came with a free Apple TV, and this was a couple of years ago. And I remember thinking, this is so cool, but what am I going to do with it? So the first time I tried to watch something, I was like, oh, my gosh, my bull. I tried to watch like half a movie, and then it was like, date is finished, you know. Now, suddenly, we are living within the unlimited world, unkept world. You don't feel it. But the moment I have to visit a relative that doesn't have Wi-Fi in their house, trust, trust you. Trust that I you do feel the void. Feel it, yes. So it's mm -hmm. still quite uh, for as long as the middle class is smaller than the class that doesn't have access. Traditional media will always have a platform, and radio is still pretty much bigger than television. I mean, radio is still such an important medium. The fact that there's still radio dramas, you wouldn't think that they're radio dramas, but they are on your African language uh, stations. So. So, I mean, you work very closely with the national broadcast and you have a, probably a better understanding of the inner workings of the machine than, than any of us would. Do you sense that, that the broadcasters shifted their perspectives on how to provide content or whether it's in terms of format or in terms of the content of the story itself or narrative or how do you think they're thinking differently about free-to-air content and mass market appeal off the back of some of the, the changing dynamics uh, in the content universe? Um, what I can tell you is over the past few years, with anything you submit or any conversation you have about a TV show, you have to have uh, come to the table. What is the digital life of this? What is the second okay. life of okay. this concept? So yeah. I'll give you an example. Let's say you have a music uh, reality competition show. Other than just taking clips from the show to put online, what else can you do online? You look at your idols, The Voice, they try to create second life for mm. the television shows. And this applies also to your multi-choice shows as well. So the broadcaster doesn't have a choice because they know and understand that you're talking to two different audiences, but the audiences can feed in, into each other. With my show, I've had people tune in because they saw something on TikTok, which I, I, for me, the TikTok was the biggest surprise of the entire platform because I never thought this long form talk show would have people coming to watch it because they saw a short little clip on TikTok, but they were curious, like, oh, what is this about? And then they went and watched the, the, the long form. You have mm -hmm. a few who are at home that can tune in and watch on the national broadcaster, maybe those that don't have access to, to data or whatever the case may be, and they watch on TV. And then you have those who watch online. And again, traditional media in South Africa, you're predominantly talking South Africa. The moment it's digital, it's global. Yeah, I, I mean, that's an interesting one because you talk to traditional publishers as well, potential authors who've got a great idea or come with a manuscript and the publisher's yeah. saying, well, how many followers have you got on Twitter? And the author's going, well, why should that matter to the quality of my writing? But yeah. it, it's difficult to separate these two worlds right now. It's, it's, it's almost useless speaking about the digital and the traditional yeah. universes like they're not inextricably connected. I mean, I'm curious as to whether the broadcaster sees that as a, uh, a commercial opportunity or whether it's just a, we should be doing this because we can't not be doing this, right? It'll be interesting yeah. to dig deeper into that. I mean, I can tell you that um, the national broadcaster licenses some of their content onto, I think there's a platform called Viu, V-I-U, mm -hmm. um, Telcom One. So mm -hmm. it definitely is commercial. They are making yeah. money back. And the reason that I think there's an audience is because, you know, we're still nostalgic as South Africans. So if mm. you can watch Yuzo Yuzo that aired many years ago on View or Telcom One or any other streaming platform, yes, it was a traditional media show, but you can't get it anymore. And we're not digging, you know, you're not going to the DVD store to go ask for that South African series. You can stream it online. 
So it is a second incoming for mm. the national broadcaster, especially the archive footage, because we're very nostalgic. We love to watch, you know, content of Brenda Fasse back in the day or Jam Ali's first season. So yes, we want to watch those things. And I think beyond it being about it being an income generator, the national broadcaster doesn't have a choice. That's where we are going. That's, sure. That's, that's sure. where we are all going. And not to say they're going to lose viewers, but... Um, There's an evolution to recognize. Yeah. Yes. So I don't necessarily think traditional media has to become digital media, but I think that you have to have a digital hub to, to the traditional media in the same way that your print newspaper. You can still go buy the print newspaper, but that print newspaper also has a digital site that you can subscribe to. So I want to get more personal and I want to talk yeah. more about your projects. And one of the things I need to understand from you is how you've managed to fit 72 hours of work into every 24 hour day. But we'll, <laughs> we'll get to that now, now, because <laughs> um, that's definitely something I want to productize and sell on your behalf. Um, but I want to talk first about your show and, and I want to find out, this is the beautiful thing, I guess, of, of the way, the way uh, we produce content today. And when I say we, I mean individuals that are exploring new channels and new platforms and new audiences uh, and new ways of structuring content. Have you felt that the show has evolved quite dramatically from your original vision to where it is now? Or is it pretty much the same thing, but just bigger? Uh, how has that journey been for you? And what have you learned in the process? Uh, the, the, the way that the show came about was me saying I must talk because at the mm -hmm. time I was um, on music radio and I was like, mm -hmm. I must talk. Then I was like, but I'm a visual person, let's have visuals. So when I started looking around, cause you know, you do your research, what's out there, what are people doing? Then I was like, but what did I actually enjoy? And my first reference point was Oprah Winfrey's old episodes where you're like, what, mm -hmm. what that mm -hmm. happened to that person? And that was literally it, I was like, old Oprah ep episodes of just conversations. It's not rushed. There's no ad breaks. There's no mm. million links reintroducing the topic. It's just a sit down conversation. So I would say we're still doing that. Just a sit down conversation, tackling taboo issues, societal issues with everyday people, because we know Oprah blew up when she took the mic and put it in the audience and stopped trying to talk to celebrities. That's when she blew up where she was like, actually, who are you and what's your story? So I would say we are doing the same thing, but it just got bigger. I mean, I was shocked the um, day before yesterday to discover that we, our audience online is only 60% of South Africa, that our second audience is in, is the U S you know, and extraordinary, yeah. you know, our first season, we did not, you know, I can expose myself. We did not subtitle the show in full because we were subtitling for delivery to broadcaster. Yeah. And I had always said from the beginning, yes, we're licensing the show. It was always going to be a digital show where the channel came on board or not. And they did come on board and we said, great, you can have 24 minutes, but whatever else it, it, we will put online as a whole because we own the content. Mm. Mm. And the mistake we made is not realizing that don't forget when you're online, you're talking to a global audience and consider the fact that some people don't watch with audio. So yeah. you have to subtitle pretty much everything. 100%, yeah. So that's in ways of how it grew bigger is that I wasn't aware we're talking to a global audience as much as we were. And I also wasn't aware that the stories would relate I know they're global issues, but the way we're so South Africanized and how we speak in some and how we tackle some of the issues, I'm surprised you'll have somebody in the Netherlands who's like, I really love this, or a woman in Louisiana who's like, I can totally relate. So it definitely is bigger. It definitely is um, also has room to grow. But I think we figured out the formula for traditional media meets digital in a way that, you know, I couldn't have even planned. That's a really fascinating insight around the universal appeal of sometimes quite culturally nuanced content, because 
it's been interesting to watch. I mean, we know that we've been able to, as South Africans, adapt to um, Eurocentric or US-centric content over the years. And we've got very comfortable with those idioms and figures of speech and yeah. sometimes even baseball references or whatever it might be that like we would have even adopted as our own because certainly from, from my experience growing up, they were sort of part of our lexicon and part of our... What's been interesting is that just really great content seems to resonate um, anywhere in the world. And so, you're, you know, you're having, as, as your example, I think clearly, clearly illustrates is that no matter how culturally nuanced something is, if there is a degree of authenticity behind it, if it has human appeal, uh, if the narrative is one that I can connect with on any level, um, the chances of me spending time consuming it are really good um and that's exactly it i think you've hit the nail on the head i mean i uh, one of my guilty pleasures is i allow myself to go down the youtube rabbit hole now and then mm, mm. and just to sort of explore what kind of content is out there and you know one would think so, someone like me who loves conversation who loves like deep talk that i wouldn't get sucked into cleaning videos and you know um packing videos and uh, there's this woman Unboxing. i watch who does bento box lunch boxes for her husband and <laughs> she literally just does bento lunch boxes for her husband and that's her channel and you get sucked into these videos and you know i'm i'm wondering if she would ever think that there's a Tswana Betty girl in south africa that's sitting watching her like prepare these meals with chopsticks prepare them and you know, ordain the life of, of what I eat in Japan. So it definitely is universal. And like you say, if content is authentic, then people watch. And I'd like to think that what what we are doing with my team is authentic. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, it certainly seems to be that way. And as you've now brightly pointed out, the stats kind of endorse that, right? Like the yeah. numbers don't lie. So yeah. um. I want, to, I want to expand it because, I mean, this is just one part of the giant ecosystem of things you're involved in. There's two businesses that you are a critical component of the survival of. You're on industry bodies. You are mentoring and teaching. You're facilitating. How how are you? I mean, you're running a family, <laughs> yes. an amazing family, a growing family. Um, how are you? Th how do you think about time? Really? How do you? How do you prioritize your energy? Because I can imagine, I mean, I, I can barely get off the couch in the morning. I don't know how you do what you do. Um, so, so talk to me about how you, how you think about your time and, and how you make sure that your energy is maintained through these different yeah. channels of investment, right? So it's, it's two things. The first one is um, I stopped thinking about time management and I started thinking about energy management. Yeah. It basically is picking the hours of the day where I function the best for certain things. For example, sometimes I need to be super creative and my creative hours are in the evenings. Sometimes I need to be, you know, sit and lock down a budget and do admin. And those hours are usually first thing in the morning. So I switched from time management to energy management. Um, and that's really I hate, to, me. I hate to interrupt you, but <laughs> no, isn't, that one of the, isn't that one of the gifts maybe of lockdown is that we've been able to design our days more around our natural cycles than around uh, when you clock in and when you clock out of a Definitely. traditional office. Yeah. And I mean, for me, my TV show was birthed out of lockdown. The fact that mm. I could call a crew and say, guys, I don't have money, but I have a house and I have me, would you like to try and shoot this thing with me and maybe we can make some money out of it? And if we weren't locked down and if certain shows were not put on hold or canceled, I wouldn't have had access to yeah. the personnel yeah. and the equipment to do what I'm doing. So the energy management one is super, super important. Um, obviously now that I'm a mom for three and a half months, it's it's not just my energy management, it's also knowing when my baby's energy levels are going to be X, Y, and Z. Then the second thing um, that I had to do, I don't know if you know that quadrant, I'm sure it's got a name, but where I had to differentiate between what is not important, not urgent, what is important, urgent, what is not urgent, important, and urgent and important. Mm, so mm. I had to really 
start to edit my plate into those quad quadrants and had to say, I will tend to things that are urgent, important first, and then constantly assess what is important, let it become, uh, if it needs to become urgent or if I have energy and time to tend to it. Um, and I'd almost say those are sort of the two tools that I'm working with at the moment. But the biggest tool is just, excuse my French, but you really have to have fewer fucks to give about things that are just small. <laughs> you know, you really have not to... Not important, have, not urgent. <laughs> not important, not urgent, not my problem, not my business. Like I, I've had to become, being the Virgo control freak that I am, I had to become a master of delegating and letting go, not just delegating and like hovering and checking it's done. It's like delegating and letting go. And just also surrounding myself with the right people in terms of my team that now I don't just hire an assistant that um, knows what I need on set. I hire an assistant who also knows that I need to pump milk before I leave the house and knows that sometimes I forget to eat and knows that, you know, if we're having this problem, this is the person to call. So mm -hmm. it, it's, it's a whole ecosystem of right thinking, right timing, right energy, sometimes saying, no, I'm not available. And sometimes saying this can wait, or sometimes saying this will only take me two minutes to do. So I'm doing it quickly. So you've segued beautifully into my next question because <laughs> I mean, in Black Swan and Laborcha, you've got these teams of talented people around you that support yeah. the work that needs to be done. And like you said, there is definitely a best use of your time equation that you need to constantly be interrogating and investing in because yeah. there's a lot that you could be doing, but just because you can be doesn't mean you should be. And the, the downside of doing all the things that you could possibly do, but not yeah. that you should be doing is that you're busy, but there's no value right? Like yes. you're not producing the outcomes you want at the end of the day. So the question I wanted to ask, and this actually circles back to where our conversation started around, I mean, one of the good byproducts, I think, of the, the, the explosion of consumer generated media is that there are a lot of very young, very talented individuals who've seen media creation, publishing, broadcasting as an opportunity for their own career path. Mm. And maybe, maybe individuals that wouldn't have considered it before. Now, obviously, there's a lot that we wish wouldn't consider it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we'll put them over there and we'll talk about the really talented people that how do you, how do you think about f finding, selecting, and then growing talent in your businesses? Oh. Um, you know, I'm in two minds about it because I'm a loyalist, if that's a real word. I'm yeah, we'll make it so. <laughs> Just especially in the sense that I like to stick to people that I know, but I mm. also am a supporter of giving opportunity to new people. I mean, you've mentioned mentioned that I I mentor. So in my mentoring, a lot of the times you have people who are just green and just need to to get a feel for what it's about. But sometimes a project doesn't give opportunity for that. For example, if I get a call now that says, tomorrow we need you to do an online campaign that requires you to interview the CEO of a company, plus do a photo shoot, plus blah, blah, blah. It's too short notice for me to brief, you know, a young green uh, a content creator assistant, to do with yeah. me or assistant or whatever the case may be. And in that case, I will take somebody that I'm like, okay, we just need to get the job done. It's deadline driven. We don't have time. But there are situations where I can take someone along. And it's a pity COVID has really restricted the number of individuals that we work with. So often, especially on set, we'll have interns just to expose them. And now because we need to work with a skeleton, a crew as possible, um, we haven't been able to do that. But young talent, uh, I'm very pro-black, pro-female. A lot of my, my teams are quite female-heavy teams. Um, it, it's it's important to me because, you know, in my time, Bastana Kumalo was like the only black female producer that I knew of that had her own company and also was front of the ca uh, the camera. And then I was like, yeah. is this it? Like, who else can I talk to to get advice on certain dynamics I need to deal with in the in the workplace? 
So it's important for me to just create opportunity. Um, but also, uh, I, I'm also of the view that you have to work with great talent. It can't just be because you're a woman or because you're black or because you're a minority group. So developing of talent, uh, what I've also learned is there's skills you can learn at school, but there's certain things that are just character. Some people mm. come from mm. homes that taught them some things that don't make sense in real life, and it doesn't matter that you have a degree. Some people um, just have terrible attitudes, even though they're very talented. Sure. You sure. know, so it's 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 been finding the balance of who fits on what project, who fits in what role, at what time, because I also try to be the type of boss who's understanding, um, mm. especially because now we're more conscientized to you know mental health, what we're going sure. through at the moment. Um, a lot more people are, are vulnerable with the tricky times. And sometimes, especially with the type of content we are doing, where we're talking about rape, we're talking about bipolar disorder, mental health issues, we're talking about murder. We are a set where we have to say, guys, everybody has a pass. If you're feeling overwhelmed, you don't have to explain. You literally sure. ask to stop shooting and you can leave. We don't ask any questions because the content we're working with is so triggering. I mean, I've cried on set a few times. So it's 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 a it's a different way of thinking while sticking to what we know we need. But also the multi-skilled young people are the ones that I think um, are, are, are going to be the ones to make it quicker than others. The ones that can edit and shoot and, you know, the content creators we see today that are doing everything themselves and coming up with clever tricks to do on their cameras and clever little campaigns. The, the specialist they, generalists. Yes, they literally are. And um, yeah. we come from the, the generation of you do one thing. I'm just sure. an editor and I'm a flippin' good editor. Yeah. Now it's like, hey, if, if you're restricted to a smaller crew, you want multi-skilled people. I come from the era of I needed to know what everyone does and how they do it so I can be better at my job. Hence, I can produce, present, write a script, run the auto queue. I, I can do a lot of things, and that served me well. So I think just, yeah, with, with new talent, it's, it's a tricky one. It's trying to find the balance also because everybody wants to be in this industry. Level, you've spoken about the, the depth and intensity of the conversations that you are wanting to have and wanting to share with the world. And it's, I mean, it, it won't be lost on you that like one, one of the things that I think I lament most about society at the moment is that we've, we seem to have uh, devalued, albeit kind of like given up on the lost art of decent conversation, yeah. like really <laughs> in-depth, rigorous debate, uncomfortable stuff, the you know what I mean? Even between friends, yeah. uh, there's this misconception that if I like you, I can't disagree with you. Yeah. And if I disagree with you, then I can't like you, which is a really strange heuristic that we seem to have like adopted all of a sudden. And this inability to kind of say, you know, I like, I like Rila Bukhili, but I don't like that one idea that she's got. Yeah. And they're not the same thing. She's a person with ideas or I really like that idea that she's got, but I don't really like her as a person, whatever, you know. So, so you're, you're kind of, you're standing up as a bastion for important and difficult conversations. Mm. Um, how do you prepare yourself for those? And how do you, I mean, obviously you're doing a lot of research. Obviously uh, you're working at understanding the perspective of the interviewee and, and their world. But in that moment, how do you practice the art of better conversation in those in in the middle of a show? Funny enough, I know everybody thinks, "Oh my gosh, Lebrille does so much research for her show." Um, I almost feel like my years in the industry, becoming a mom, being where I am in my life, prepared me for this show in the sense that when I started in radio, talk radio, the slot that I had which was a graveyard shift where anybody could talk about anything. My boss at the time said to me, you just need to know everything about everything. And I was like, what? Because I don't have a journalism degree. What should I, you know, what's my thing? Easy talk show yes. host, 
has a thing. And he's like, no, don't have a thing. Just be yourself and know everything about everything, which would mean skimming through articles of all types. So because of that, we would interview anything from a politician to a health expert to a celebrity. I got familiar with everything about everything. Fast forward to my talk show where I said to myself, I want to come to this platform with the perspective of a viewer who has questions, who under normal circumstances would not be able to ask them. Not because we're, you know, things are politicized and we're overly sensitive, but you're not really supposed to be asking certain questions. But let me create a space where we can ask those questions as inappropriate as they may be in real life so that we know it's for knowing and educational purposes. So under normal circumstances, you wouldn't ask um, somebody, you know, who is transgender, what genitalia they have. You wouldn't say that to somebody. But on my show, I've created a space where we do say it because we're trying to educate and teach and, and explore and learn. And I said to myself, if I want to go into the space with an open mind, it means not knowing too much. Because if I know too much, I'm not going to listen with the same ear. I'm not going to see the person with the same um, with the same vision eye, but also um, I need to be as objective as possible. So if I'm interviewing somebody mm, who's yeah. murdered somebody, if you know too much, you're going to come in bias and it will show. Whereas I'm trying to have sit down conversations where there's as little judgment as possible. There is uh, ample curiosity, but it's also safe because you know, I have people that are telling me how their own, a person who's telling me how their own father raped her when she was seven years old. I'm talking to a woman whose father killed himself in front of his wife. I'm talking to, like, these are the type of conversations. I'm talking to two intersex individuals. Now, under normal circumstances, if someone says my father killed himself, you're not going to ask the details. But we get to have that conversation where now a viewer gets to go, I get it. We get to normalize subjects mm. that are taboo. We don't need to keep asking what intersex is because, hey, I saw that conversation on Gleb Khilis show and I get it. We don't get to ask, you know, why Rulani as a blind person um, is this question uncomfortable? Or why is this inappropriate? Or what is actually a defamatory thing to call you? And that's the kind of space where I had to say, come in neutral, come in not knowing too much. Know mm. just enough to facilitate the conversation, but don't know too much that you already have made up your mind about what's what. And also allow yourself to be surprised with the details of the story and allow yourself the, the, the open-mindedness and the blank canvas to learn. It's such a tenuous balance between being informed about something, but also staying objective about it, isn't it? I mean, that's a real skill. So on behalf of all of those and all of us that enjoy the show, I really do, do appreciate that Thank you walk, you. You walk that tightrope, right? That's not an easy tightrope to walk. But because you are somebody who knows a lot about a lot and also somebody that I know flies off the cuff better than anyone I've ever met, um, I'm going to ask you two questions that I ask on all of these shows. Oh. And... and um, there are really two questions that I guess are just reflections in many ways. The first one would be, if you could go back in time and you had the opportunity to speak a single sentence of advice or whatever it might be, motivation to your 18-year-old self, what would you go back in time and say to her? Oh, this is easy. Uh, go. This too shall pass. That has been my life motto for many years. And the reason is, People think this too shall pass only applies to bad situations where obviously you're comforting somebody, this too shall pass, but it also applies to good situations. So it wow. reminds you that, hey, life is um, cyclic. Life is seasonal. You're having a great moment. This too shall pass. Enjoy it. Be present hmm. for it. Appreciate it because this too shall pass. So I definitely would say to my 18-year-old self, this too shall pass. The confusion, the joy, the youth, the creativity, the being able to take the stairs without feeling it, <laughs> the not being a mom, this too shall pass. So it applies really to, to everything. And I would say that to my 18-year-old self. I've never heard that spin on it, and it's terrific. It really yeah, is. It's uh, wisdom. 
It's extraordinary wisdom. The second question I'd love uh, you to answer is, if you had the opportunity to introduce a book that would become compulsory reading in, in the primary education system in South Africa, a book that every young child in South Africa should read, mm -hmm. uh, or every growing child in South Africa should read, what book would you insert into the system uh, in a draconian fashion and why? Mm, a book. I'm torn with this one. You're allowed to. The but only because it's you. The Alchemist. Mm -hmm. It's about purpose. Um, the second one is The Art of Creative Thinking, which The Alchemist being Paolo Coelho. I can't remember now the author of The Art of Creative Thinking. I'll make a note of it and we I'll can add it to the check, show notes. Check yeah. that. But the, what I love about The Art of Creative Thinking is it's such an easy read. It's not one continuous story. You can hop from chapter to chapter. And basically, the author tells lots of little stories of how creative thinking can just improve your life. And one of the examples he used is that he was, you know, invited to consult, I think, in Dubai on some soapy that was losing viewers. And he's like, I'm not necessarily a storyteller. This is not my expertise, but he has different types of clients. And he was brought in as a fixer. And the first exercise he did, you know, they brought him to a boardroom with all the creatives, the head writer, the script writer. And he said, no, I want everybody in the room. I want the janitor. I want the accountant. They're like, no, we yeah. don't need them. We want you to fix the story. He said, shh, <laughs> called everybody in the room. And he started changing their roles and giving everybody an opportunity to present a creative idea. And he turned it around because he said, everybody is creative. And sometimes job titles restrict us from thinking not just the person who is the accountant but how the world views them that they aren't creative mm. but everybody mm. is creative and they all have to be creative in varying degrees and how you can apply it to your work to your your purpose in life to um how you map out your day so i think the art of creative thinking is super important it just goes to show that it almost like levels out the playing field um especially when it comes to just how you apply your mind. So my friend, if it was just recognizing the role that you play as an entrepreneur, as a producer, as a role model, as a businesswoman in South Africa, I'd already have a lot to thank you for and be quite intimidated by, if I'm honest. <laughs> but when I start adding things like industry influencer, lobbyist, uh, mentor, coach, uh, mother, partner, friend, I, I, I gobsmacked at what you achieve and the energy you have for other people and the, and the ripples of your life and your influence in the lives of so many others. And I'm just like on behalf of all of us, I'm quite grateful you were born. You. And um, thank you for being a part of the solution and okay. for being driven to find uh, uh, solutions to the problems that I think like I said right up front, many of us have, have kind of even given up asking. So you know, we're just very grateful to you. And thank you for taking time to chat to me today. Thank you. And I think just to 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 end it on the note that, um, especially because we were speaking so much about content, the content I do is purpose-driven content. And that's just mm. where, where I am is um, I'm not just doing it for ish and giggles. I'm trying to follow my purpose through the content that I do and obviously it's not possible if we don't have viewers so to everybody who watches engages supports talks inspires the guests those that watch um that communicate like thank you and thank you for having me yeah thanks for being here well as we know this too shall pass, this too shall pass. <laughs> I hope you take that with you have a wonderful week my friend and we'll I chat will. to you soon chat soon <laughs> bye